Welcome to the information session for our Masters of Science in Patient Safety and Healthcare Quality. So my name is Morgan Fredericks and I will now turn it over to Dr. Albert Wu to start the introductions for our presenters today. Just checking and um, Morgan, I, um... I wonder if it's me. I was uh, I heard you breaking up a little bit, but I, it like I said, it's very possible that it's all me today. So um, anyway, I um, wanted to let Matt Austin introduce himself. Oh, wow. Thanks, Albert. I appreciate it. Good evening. Good morning. Good afternoon to all of you, depending on where you are in the world. I'm Matt Austin. Um, I'm one of the uh, co-directors of the Masters of Applied Science in Patient Safety and Healthcare Quality Program. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. I also am a faculty member at the Johns Hopkins Armstrong Institute for Patient Safety and Quality. Um, and in that role, I actually teach a course that's part of the, uh, the master's program as well. So uh, look forward to to sharing with you this evening, morning, and afternoon. And I'll hand it back to Albert. Actually, I'm going to bounce off to, uh, we have a special guest, um, Melissa uh, Klitzman. Uh, can you say hello? Hello, everyone. It's nice to be back <laughs> virtually. I'm, I'm Melissa Klitzman. I am a recent graduate from the Master's in Applied Science Program in Patient Safety and Healthcare Quality. Um, I am calling from Indianapolis, Indiana right now, um, where I am a pediatrician and I work in a um, level four newborn intensive care unit. And I'm applying everything I learned from <laughs> my pro from the program in my clinical capacity and like quality improvement and patient safety um, projects that I'm doing as well. So. And hearing that makes us so happy. Uh, <laughs> I am Albert Wu. I'm um, an internist and a professor of health policy and management and a professor of medicine. And uh, one of my favorite things that I do is direct this master's program. I'm also uh, one of the principals in the Armstrong Institute, along with Matt. And I am, in theory, the director of uh, strategic collaborations, uh, mostly, which I think means external collaboration. But why don't we get going? And Morgan, do you have control uh, over uh, the slides and everything else? Sure do. Uh, so let's see. Um, do you want to just run over our agenda, uh, Morgan? Absolutely. Um, so we will start off by kind of giving an industry overview. We'll transition to some program details and to the curriculum of our program. Um, we'll chat a little bit about collaboration and online learning, highlight some of our esteemed faculty in the MAS program. I'll go over the admissions requirements for the program as well touch base a little bit on financial aid um, and things of that nature. Um, then hopefully we will hear from Melissa and she will say such good things about our program. Um, and we will wrap it up with a quick, well, it doesn't have to be a session. Um, you can ask us questions about the, of course, admissions process, program in general, and even ask our special guests some questions. Okay. So, and we will try to get through the, the official program at sort of a little bit expeditiously so that we really do have time for you to ask personal questions. And um, uh, I mean, not really personal questions, like how many children do you have and how old are you, but uh, questions that are of personal relevance to you. And um, uh, uh, we're more at the moment anyway we're not such a big group that we can't answer and be able to answer every one of your questions so uh 
when uh, when I started in this field, which was in 1990, there were no such thing as careers in patient safety. But since that time, a lot have a lot has changed. And uh, there are more and more people sort of in general, uh, not just specialists and enthusiasts, but but people in general who are enthusiastic and are committed to improving healthcare quality and to patient safety. The challenge is that even though there is an increasing number of job opportunities and, uh, uh, and other opportunities, in the field that there is not there are not that many opportunities really to get the expertise the training um, and in particular i think some of the science that underpins uh patient safety some of those things are also very practical um how to design a project how to analyze data how to measure things and how to use measures in your work and all of these things are necessary if you're going to lead uh, perhaps initially work in this area, but ultimately lead in this area. So uh, in any event, the good news is too, that all of these concepts are useful. Even if you do not uh, have a full-time career in patient safety, these are things that really honestly, every busy professional in healthcare should have. We, in fact, teach some of the basics to all of our medical students and all of our nursing students at Johns Hopkins, though nothing like this master's program. There are, here's just a few of the possible job titles, and I will not read them all, but director of quality management, patient safety officer, um, nurse director of quality improvement, or for that matter, nurse director of hospital patient safety, uh, director of Vice President of Safety and Quality or Quality Management, um, Patient Safety Officer or Consultant. All of these things are, in fact, job descriptions. Um, and those job descriptions are circulating around. They are looking for people who have this expertise. But again, there are only a few, there are really still a limited number of opportunities to really get um, the relevant training. Next, please. Peter Pronovost, who is uh, who may be along with me in part, um, got patient safety off the ground uh, in uh, in the late 1990s and the early 2000s. Um, but uh, Peter uh, was director and founding director of the Armstrong Institute and was vice president, senior vice president for patient safety and quality for all of Johns Hopkins Medicine. There's another job description description or job title that, that that is available. And he said, organizations profess patient safety as a top quality, a top priority. But they're still figuring out how to manage it with the same rigor, discipline, and accountability that they do with their budgets. And there is no healthcare organization that doesn't pay close attention to um, their budget and accounting for uh, for the dollars. But they're not, we're not so good in general. I would say Hopkins might be a little bit better at doing that accounting with quality and safety. Um, there are some statistics which um, you'd think that they would change from year to year, but I think the fact is, is that they simply get confirmed from year to year. And on average in the US and, and in, across much of the world, of all patients hospitalized, an average of one in 10 is harmed some way or other by, well, while receiving care. There are, uh, this was actually an earlier statistic, but there, um, the last time this was measured very rigorously, there are at least a million and a half preventable adverse drug effects, events, that is uh, mistakes that cause harm due to medications in the US. Now, we used we used to say and maybe we still say that medical errors med medication errors are the most common kind of medical error but new newer research suggests that um that misdiagnosis which as you can imagine is hard, harder to count may be even more common 
and the legal payouts due to a missed diagnosis. Think of all of those cases where someone missed a diagnosis of cancer or someone showed up with a fever and the, uh, the diagnosis of sepsis was missed. Those payouts, and these are just legal payouts, exceed $100 billion a year in the US. So um, some of our colleagues who are, are teaching in this, uh, in this degree program would argue that it is misdiagnoses or inaccurate diagnoses that are the most common and perhaps costly of all medical errors. So we can, we can have that debate. And if, you're, if you enter this program, you can participate in that. But uh, that is uh, to all to say that these things are very common and can have terrible effects. Next, please. So this is a full Johns Hopkins master's degree program, which is run out of the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. It's accredited um, by uh, all of the organizations that accredit public health programs in the US. It's a very skills-based um, curriculum and it's designed really for people who are working. For that reason, it's part-time and it's 100% online. While we had thought about offering pieces of this, requiring people to come to Baltimore to do this, we um, over the years have had students from Japan, from India, from Africa, from Australia, and in fact, it uh, isn't that convenient necessarily to drop what you're doing, particularly if you are working um, at something else to uh, to take our program. So in general, people are um, are very happy that it's available in this form. It is a, a total of 48.5, 48 and a half credits. Um, and there are at Hopkins, there are four terms a year. The program can be done as quickly as in two years, but it can also be done over three or four years. There are courses, there are professional development opportunities, and the, the culminating project at the end of the at the end of the course is an integrative activity where you're intended to design your own project and use the things that you've been accumulating over the years. Um, this is very up to date and we, um, Johns Hopkins teaches a lot of courses. Uh, the School of Public Health uh, has something like 1500 courses that it teaches. Um, and, uh, but these courses are very oriented on delivering skills. There are projects, there are, uh, there are group projects, there are many examples given, there's a lot of hands on do this or do that as the assignment. And the reason you do this or do that is because if you ever work in the field, you will need to do this or to do that. You will need to be able to conduct a root cause analysis of a problem. Uh, the focus is to educate students on the measurement of safety and quality, on designing safer systems, on changing uh, organizations and changing culture on patient-centered care, on, on preventing harm. These are all quality, these are all characteristics or these are all dimensions of good quality care. And again, you can see how this might have broad applicability. Next, please. Um, the curriculum is, uh, runs over the, if you do this at the, uh, at full velocity, it is a two-year curriculum with 24 credits per year. Uh, in general, that means two courses a term. Uh, there are a few other um, incidental courses you need to uh, get some orientation and education about research ethics and academic ethics. You need to learn how to use our online systems, but those are not four credit courses. Um, the course starts with an introduction to, oops, we've, this, is, this is actually backwards. The, it starts with an introduction to uh, to the science of patient safety, um, and uh, and some seminars, which are in fact general seminars um, that have to do with um, pu public health. In the second term, so we're in the middle of that. We're just finishing that term now, that course now. 
in the second term, the second quarter, there is the uh, course on the introduction to quality of care for practitioners. As you can see, if you think about it, patient safety and quality of care are a little bit of the foundations. There are, is a special course on case studies of uh, all different kinds from all different contexts of quality and safety, perhaps some best practices. There are courses as this is a fully accredited master's program in Epi and Biostat. Um, and we try to coach people in writing because in fact, that is something that everyone needs to do sometime, whether you're writing an, uh, an email uh, to convince something of someone or a blog or a memo or a research paper or an evaluation, all of those things are absolutely necessary. Um, and the in the fourth term, the key patient safety course is leading for change. In year two, there's a bit more on uh, biostatistics, but in the first term, there's a, a course on tools for quality improvement, like, for example, root cause analysis or teamwork training or um, uh, Six Sigma. Uh, in the second term, uh, there is actually a, a, a focus on the next term of epidemiology, which some people find a little challenging and also an advanced seminar in public health topics. The third and fourth terms are really, uh, things really pick up a little bit. There is a course on measurement and evaluation and evaluating whether things work or not is crucial to almost everything. Um, an in, in, a course on infection prevention. This uh, proved to be very popular during the pandemic, as you might imagine. In fact, we opened it um, in a one-time way for other students, and we had many people who took this course. Um, and then finally, the last term, there's an integrative activity. There's time for you to do that integrative activity on a project of your choosing and to accompany that so that you, you know, sort of are um, able to perhaps better integrate all of the skills that you've accumulated. Dr. Austin teaches a course on, which is really a lab on quality and safety and um, how to measure things. All right. Next, please. Um, this is a, this is the most multidisciplinary thing that I do. Um, the, uh, it is run out of the School of Public Health, but there are faculty from the School of Medicine, from the School of Nursing, and many faculty um, are from the Armstrong Institute for Patient Safety um, and Healthcare Quality. Virtually, I think something that is unique about this program is virtually every instructor is someone who is a world-renowned expert in safety and quality. Um, we've uh, been one of the longest, uh, we've had sort of perhaps the longest experience of uh, uh, in, in any, uh, of any university in teaching online, um, uh, teaching health courses online. We've, we now have hundreds of courses online and during the pandemic, every course in the School of Public Health was taught online. So the courses are, have high production values. They're, they're served up in bite-sized modules. I think they're basically um, pretty engaging. They're, they're in, in, intended not to put you to sleep. Um, all of the lectures are recorded. Even the live sessions are recorded so that people can review them. It is possible to binge watch um, a, a number of lectures on your, on your couch while lying supine. Um, if you need to catch up, but though we do re recommend that people keep up. Next, please. We, the proud thing that we are probably the proudest of is that we have uh, some world leaders in patient safety who are here to teach your courses. I will only touch on a couple, um, but uh, perhaps most prominent is Matt Austin, who, oh, oh look, there he is. Um, Matt is in fact in charge of uh, measurement and dashboards for the LeapFrog group, which is one of the most prominent um, uh, organizations looking at quality in healthcare. Um, he designs the measures, does the data analysis, and when they come out in the news, um, uh, he just sort of keeps quiet and says, oh, it's those LeapFrog people. Um, Cheryl, uh, uh, Himmelfarb is one, is a one of the foremost nurse leaders in patient safety on the academic side. 
Um, Lisa Maragakis is an infectious disease physician who is the a lead for hospital epidemiology and infection control for Johns Hopkins Medicine. During the pandemic, she was the lead in our uh, command center. She was, in fact, the lead commander and was basically in charge of the whole medical center for several months uh, early in the pandemic. Jill Marsteller is a leader in evaluation. John McGreedy, who I will mention, is someone who can teach statistics so that even if you are sort of a math phobe, by the end of the course, you will surprise yourself and, and know statistics. Um, Peter Pronovost, uh, as, as mentioned earlier, is uh, one of the perhaps best known figures in patient safety. He's uh, actually eloped off to uh, university hospitals in Cleveland for um, some good personal reasons. Um, but was on the president's uh, committee for science and technology that just uh, that just concluded some of its work. Um, Melinda Sawyer is a nurse, but who is now the uh, head, one of the medical direct the very top medical directors for United Healthcare, in charge of healthcare quality. Kathy Sutcliffe invented uh, high reliability theory, and so these are just a few, but uh, these are the people who are teaching your courses. Next, please. So off back to Morgan. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Wu. Okay, for students who are interested in applying to our program, we complete the application via SOFIS, um, which is kind of an online application portal at several schools. Um, we are typically looking for students that are in the mid-level of their career. Um, so we require students to have about three years health-related experience. Um, students have to have a bachelor's degree under their belt. Um, and we scripts from every school that you have been to. So even the credits you got that transferred in, we need the transcript for that as well. Um, we need a resume. CV, three letters of recommendation, and the letters of recommendation could come from someone that you know in your career, plus may know from completing your academic journey. Um, ideally, at least one of those letters of recommendation would be from a, an advisor or a supervisor. Um, we also require students to submit a statement. This, um, which I would say is one of the most important parts of your application. It's where you get to um, present yourself and put your best foot forward. It's important in your statement of purpose to really identify um, your knowledge of what the program actually is about, um, why you're interested in a program, and how the program apply to your career, um, what your plans are with using the program in the future. National student, we would require you to complete an English proficiency exam. Um, sometimes those exams can be kind of depending on the circumstances. Um, and then for international students, your transcripts need to be evaluated um, by a credential evaluation service. Our preferred credential evaluation service is WES. Um, and send you more information on that as well for all of our international application applicants. Um, applications are reviewed on a rolling basis. So once your application is submitted um, and verified, we typically are able to decision within about two weeks. Um, the deadline for the application is July 1st, 2024. Um, so although the deadline is uh, a bit far away, I always suggest students to submit sooner rather than later, um, especially for our international students. Um, it tends to take a lot longer than expected to kind of get all of your application um, components together and sent into us. So again, I starting the process sooner rather than later. Um, students, again, can apply all throughout the year up until July 1st, and the start date for the fall term would be August 26, 2024. Okay, so let's chat a little bit about kind of financial aid and tuition. 
Um, so for the 2020-23 school year, the tuition would be $1,270 per credit. Um, one great thing about the OPAL program is that once you're admitted into the program, um, you're also awarded the OPAL scholarship. Um, the OPAL scholarship this year um, reduces tuition per credit by $508. Um, BIA scholarship is a great financial aid office that can assist, assist with like federal and private loans, and they have a funding resources. They have a list of different scholarship opportunities that students have been successful using in the past. So I would be more than happy to share that information to anyone that needs it. Um, here is the information to the financial aid. Um, but of course, if you contact the OFL office, we can give you that information as well. Okay. Um, so before we open it up to our full q and A, I I definitely want to kind of kick it over to Matt and Melissa. Great. Thanks so much, Morgan. Appreciate it. And Melissa, if you don't mind, maybe just share, if you can share a little bit more about yourself in terms of your sort of professional role, um, if you're in sort of a quality and safety role today, what does that look like? I'm just wondering, I think some additional context to, to who you are and the work you do might be helpful to sort of set the stage for future questions. Sure, yeah. Um, so, so I will say this, my, the, this was the, the best professional decision I've made um, for my career and my, you know, bosses and like division chiefs they were ready for me to like get all of this knowledge. So they, I think they already had um, some ideas of where I could go with this and a lot's happening here just within our health system. So I, um, even before I finished my degree, so probably like March of this past year, um, I was tapped to be our perinatal centers um, quality improvement consultant. So we have our perinatal center, which is kind of like an academic health center, similar to John Hopkins with affiliate hospitals all throughout Indiana. So there's 13 affiliate hospitals. So I am the official consultant for that whole network, um, which is really exciting. And then um, recently I was tapped to be a patient safety officer. When I, when I saw patient safety officer on that list, I'm like, yeah, yep, yeah, that's true. Uh -huh. uh, and then just in my clinical capacity and then some other research as well, um, I'm doing a lot with um, quality improvement projects that um, have kind of more of a health equity and community-based participatory research as well. So a lot um, of really good things coming from what I learned through my degree and applying it, I mean, right out of the gate, almost right as soon as I learned all <laughs> everything. <laughs> like next day right like yeah, yeah no I mean yeah. honestly there are some things that I learned like in you know biostats like once I learned how to calculate odds ratio, you know, I was looking through articles and doing it, it's like is that right I mean just other things in terms of like quality improvement tools and then um um and then measures like making sure that we start with a denominator first and like everything was just kind of really applicable right away Wonderful. Can you talk a little bit about what got you interested in the program at Hopkins? Did you look at other programs? Yeah, um, I did. So I, um, it took me a long time to make a decision. So I got started just like kind of in, with some quality improvement projects, like in the late 2000s, just, I was a community-based hospitalist at that point and was looking to make sure we were doing screenings correctly. And then was interested in, in why some, you know, improvement was made and why some wasn't. And then I went to more an academic setting and was tapped to be, um, to lead like this QI subcommittee for maternal and newborn health and was just really interested in the subject matter. So this was probably 2017 and two, or 2018. And I started looking into formal education just because like what Albert was saying, it's when I was going through medical school, there's really nothing at least when I went through medical school like 20 years ago, there was nothing on patient safety and healthcare quality really. Um, and the same 
with the time, by the time I went through residency as well. So I was picking up things as I was going along in my career, but really wanted a formal education. And I knew it would have, I mean, I was working full time, so I knew it would have to be part time. And I knew it would have to be uh, majority online because, you know, I have a family and everything. So I couldn't like travel back and forth a lot to a place that was far away and then wanting it to be affordable as well. And then with a really good reputation. Um, so I looked at other schools and um, Johns Hopkins program just to fit all of the boxes that I was looking for. So I made the decision. Wonderful. So can you talk a little bit and what did, what did you like best about the program and I hate to maybe bring this question up, but what did you like least, right? Like what what really worked for you and what did you find challenging? So I can only pick one thing that's best about the program. Um, I think, I mean, I think that with the subject matter, like everything that I was learning was, applicable to not only what I was doing as a clinician, but what I was doing in terms of where I wanted my career to go in kind of real time, just like the examples I gave earlier. Um, so I think that was the most useful because for me, um, like for something to stick, I have to use it, you know, pretty quickly mm -hmm. um, just to get that kind of education and, and to solidify concepts and all of that. And so that was probably the one, one of the things that I could say was the best, but then also, you know, there's difficult courses as well, like biostats and epi were difficult, but the accessibility of the faculty and the TAs, I mean, is just, was just tremendous. Like I would make sure I'd go to office hours and I was having trouble. I just asked for help and it was, it was there. So it wasn't like I was just, you know, out alone on my own trying to figure things out. It was um, with the material that I was learning the accessibility of, of everyone that was on um, the faculty was, is, was extraordinary. Um, in terms of challenges, so I started my um, degree in 2000. I mean, I started the program in 2000. So honestly, it wasn't so much the program as it was COVID. <laughs> it, I mean, it was basically COVID and um, just kind of getting organized then and um, and then also, I think along with that, just the isolation during the pandemic, like Albert was saying, I, um, I, I like the idea of, um, meeting people like more often. Um, so I really look forward to the live talks. Um, and then also, um, like forming study groups as well, like creating community online. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, that that's wonderful. I appreciate you so much sharing more about yourself, about your experience, and um, I, I I think we want to give people the opportunity to to ask their questions. And if you have questions for Melissa, we would love to have you ask those as well. So, Morgan, do you want me to? I, I don't know if I'm turning it back to Albert to sort of facilitate the Q and A, or if that's oh, you're doing such a good job. Go ahead. All right, I guess I'm gonna do it. So at this point, um, if any of our uh, future Hopkins Blue Jays um, are interested in asking any questions, we'd love to, to hear from you. If you wanna ask them through Zoom, that's great. If you feel more comfortable asking them through the chat, we'd love to engage that way. Um, Albert put in some information about tuition, just to clarify for folks that with the Opal discount, the tuition works out to be approximately $762 per credit, um, and you pay as you go rather than a lump sum. So each term you pay for, if you're taking six credits, you would pay the six times the 762. Just to clarify something that I think you were talking about earlier, Albert, and something that Melissa touched on is the program is designed to be primarily asynchronous, right? So we recognize that folks are 
busy with their jobs, with their families. You know, we have folks literally from every part of the world. And so the program is set up so that you can listen to the lectures, do the assignments, all in your own pace and at your own time. But there are opportunities for everyone to come together. So each course has one or more what's known as a live talk, um, which is where the course faculty and the students come together for a live session. Those are recorded. So if for some reason you can't make that live, there's still the opportunity to, to listen. Um, and then Melissa also mentioned study groups. I think especially for the biostats course, the epi courses, um, students have found it really valuable to connect with their fellow students to help them um, succeed with those courses, because um, those tend to be two of the more challenging courses for folks. So come on, this is your chance. Uh, if uh, you've got uh, a prominent alum, administrator, a couple of the uh, course directors right in front of you, uh, you can get your questions answered directly. Or if you want to share a little bit about yourself, where are you this evening? Maha and I've been having some, yeah, Maha, your hands up. would love to, to hear from you. Uh, so hi, thank you so much. This is a, a great presentation. Uh, my name is Maha Kabir. I'm actually I'm a pharmacist by training. I'm currently a clinical pharmacist specialist quality and performance improvement uh, at Christiana next door. Yeah. And uh, I'm really quite passionate about patient safety and quality. I, I do have some uh, training in quality. I am um, CPHQ and CPPS. Uh, I, I'm also quite passionate about patient safety I, and um, I'm, I'm a member of the uh, infusion, smart infusion pump maintenance uh, program uh, at our institution. And to be honest with you, I'm, I'm actually debating between um, doing an ISMP fellowship or uh, uh, joining uh, this uh, master's program. Um, um, I, I, I would love to learn more about uh, patient safety. And I, I was, I, I feel your program is geared more towards uh, physicians and, and nurses. Uh, I don't know if you've had um, prior experience uh, or prior pharmacy pharmacists uh, through your program. Yeah, great question. Um, you know, I, as I was saying, our faculty is very interdisciplinary and we do have, I think the majority of students are not doctors, uh, though there are some. Um, uh, there are a number of nurses who are doing things, but nursing is quite a diverse uh, uh, field, but we have pharmacists, we have uh, dentists, we have veterinarians, um, and then we have folks from other things that are a little bit more public healthy. Um, we've had um, people who are not um, licensed professionals take the course. Um, uh, we had, we have, we've had a, a corpsman who, um, uh, was uh, in the military and had, did not have any degrees really, but who was in charge of all sorts of healthcare for, for the army at this point, because he was a very competent person. So, um, you know, I, I, you know, uh, I have nothing bad to say about ISMP. Um, you know, Michael Cohen is a good friend. David Yu at ISMP Canada is a good friend. And he's the only person in the world who has a shorter last name than me, because his last name is Yu, spelled Yu. But, but in any event, it, it, the focus is certainly much more on medication safety and medication use. Uh, something which you already know a lot about. I would say that what we do is quite a bit broader. Um, for example, we spend a lot of time thinking about measurements. Uh, we train you to um, be a little bit smarter in biostat and uh, clinical epidemiology if you don't already have, you know, sort of 
a lot of competency in those areas. And those things, we, we therefore teach you to, to review the literature and to read the literature and, and extract information, which is, um, it's a little different, I think. Uh, so I can't tell you what's the right thing for you. If you wanted to go more in depth with medication safety, I think, I think that the ISMP program is terrific. Um, if you were interested in sort of a broader foundation, then maybe, you know, this program is better. Great, thank you. Um, I, I do have some background of statistics from the PharmD program and, and you know, being a clin working as a clinical pharmacist, but when you say um, statistics epidemiology, are you uh, referring to, for instance, quality improvement studies, patient safety? Oh, studies? so no, that's, a, that's an entirely different thing. So the courses in Epi and Biostat are Epi and Biostat 1, which is taken by every student who gets an, a master's or a doctoral degree in, uh, in public health. So I would say that I, I, um, I would venture to say that this is probably more than what you have had previously. Um, and as we said, uh, a number of people find, uh, find the, the courses challenging, but I think that's a good thing. I think it's good to stretch potentially. Oh, great, thank you. So Pallavi, um, has a, I don't know if you've got a mic, otherwise we can read your question aloud and then continue to talk. Uh, what would you prefer, Pallavi? I got my mic now. Oh, yeah. I think, thanks again very much for this session. So I'm Pallavi, I'm actually a hematology resident uh, at Queen's University in Canada. All right, we have, can I say that for some reason or another, uh, we have a regular stream of Canadians, mostly from around Ottawa, Toronto area, some from uh, from the West and some, you know, from French speaking Canada. But we have we always have folks from Canada. For, I don't know why. <laughs> Lovely. Um, no, but thank you very much. And uh, I guess one of, I have a couple questions, actually. Um, the one I wrote out was um, because you touched a little bit on in terms of being able to connect with um, uh, connect with others as part of the program. But are there particular opportunities during um, this program in terms of actual like team based projects? So there are some of the exercises in some of the courses require uh, teamwork. Um, and as I uh, noted a bit, a bit, uh, sort of uh, a bit earlier in the chat. Um, you know, some of these things are opportunities. So these group activities are opportunities to really make. Uh, uh, we have seen make lifelong friends. Uh, we have we invite people to graduation, um, and in many cases, um, uh, people have the first time that people are ever on the Johns Hopkins campus. Uh, was for graduation. One year we had 35 graduates show up um, and it was like old home week. Uh, people were hugging and kissing and, uh, you know, uh, like, like like long lost relatives. Um, there are also, there is the possibility, some people also um, uh, become interested in doing something else outside of the curriculum that involves other um, other faculty um, and staff at Johns Hopkins. And so it, it, there are every year, there are a few people who sort of reach out, find some faculty person they're interested in and wind up working, um, you know, sort of outside of the curriculum. Um, this is this has nothing to do with Morgan, but it, it has a lot to do with Johns Hopkins. Yeah, Melissa, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I'll just add on. Um the the group based projects there's like at least a couple of them if not more that i can recall um like an epi we did a group based project that was really helpful and kind of solidifying um you know study designs um and analysis and then for our measurements um course so our like the last term um there was like a group project that was pretty much kind of continuous through the whole term. So a lot of time to interact with um, people all around the world. And then again, with the um, 
the study groups as well, because they said one of your questions is, if so, how um, is the coordinated on online platform? So, I mean, you can have an account through Johns Hopkins and you can get a Zoom link to help coordinate um, getting together. Um, we often use WhatsApp also, but then also to kind of build off of interest and in discussions, there's discussion boards for each course as well that um, we get prompts for questions, but then also students can interact with each other um, uh, for discussions on different topics. And then I will say to add on to what Albert was saying about um, graduation, I was one of the ones that went for graduation and it was really cool. It was like seeing like, cause everyone you see is on Zoom. And so to see them in real life, it's like seeing a celebrity or something. Like so it was, it was pretty cool, it was actually really cool. Did you have a second question, Lavi, yes. that you wanted? Thank you, that's very helpful. Sure. My other question is kind of more of a technical, like application related question. Um, in terms of applying from Canada, um, I mean, English institutions in Canada, do the transcripts need to be uh, verified through that uh, extra agency or? Yeah, great question. Okay, so since it's an English, institution in Canada, the transcripts would not have to be um, evaluated by WES. So you would just upload or order your transcript um, and you can go from there. Okay. Thank you. Those are my questions. Great. Well, we really hope that you'll uh, take Join the parade of illustrious Canadian yeah. Uh, yeah. clinicians and others who uh, who seem seem to enjoy the course. Yeah, the Canadians are always our favorites. So, oh, oh, sh sh well, good. not uh, that's a lot. Uh, thank you. This is it. This is your chance. I don't know what the N um, is, is short for for, for uh, N Parushnashvili, but uh, this is also uh, your this is your chance. Uh, we're very happy to have you here. Oh, okay, no questions at the time. Thank you then. Good evening. Thank you. Uh, my name is Natia. Actually, N stands for Natia. Um, yeah, I'm in the process to make a decision um which degree is better for me i have a medical degree from outside of usa uh, and i have been working in medical field for last 15 years i have uh, worked in different institution with georgetown with medstar at different location and i'm with the nih now and uh, i'm trying to determine uh, if this uh, program is good for me because um, for last seven years I have worked in transplant department as a quality specialist. So um, thinking if I need to get formal education in um, quality and patient safety. So that's why I'm here to learn more about this program so we could uh we could have some discussion offline also um it's not a simple question um the uh in fact for the um the current course that we're teaching which i'm, that I'm teaching which is the science of of safety um my co-instructor got her phd from Hopkins, but now works for MedStar in uh, in quality in their quality and safety group. So, um, uh, and she uh, really works for someone who got her initial start uh, working here on uh, what's what's really a very famous study on pre 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 preventing bloodstream infections. Um, but um, so I think it depends a little bit on where you what you want to do next and um there are you would be of course very very well positioned to benefit from the curriculum as people say chance favors the prepared mind 
um, you know a lot and you have a lot of experience. So you would have a thousand examples of quality problems and know all about the details about the what can happen and what the contexts might uh, might do. Um, and so I think you would learn a lot. Now, whether or not you need to, to have that additional sort of didactic foundation or not, it's, it's a little hard to say. Um, again, I would say, do you have an idea of what the next big thing is for you? Do you want to advance within your group? Do you want to do uh, more research? Do you want to do less research? Do you want to uh, move into a slightly different area? Um, this would help with some things, but not with everything. I understand. That's why I'm trying to determine if it's right degree for me. Um, and uh, listening that there are many, like lots of stats, <laughs> it's another thing because during my medical schools, I have not done um, stats as much as you mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> but yes. Yeah, the, the biostats that I did um, in, um, in college were better than the biostats that I did in medical school, which was a little bit of a joke. And I was a little shocked when I eventually, I eventually did a master's, an MPH program, and was a little bit shocked at having to, you know, learn multivariable statistics. Uh, I survived and uh, wound up doing more, but it was a little bit of a, you know, like a cold shower. Um, the uh, uh, there are many people who have uh, who have worked for ten and uh, Melissa, you know, worked for at least ten years. Some have worked for twenty years and um, are now going back and sort of refreshing uh, what they're doing. Uh, again, it, you could probably continue to work in your group for your entire career, um, or you could move around. It's, it's uh, that, I, I can't tell you what would be the best thing for you. I think I will add on to um, um, your, your um, statements, Nadia, just because I considered myself like mid-career when I applied. Um, so I was 14 years after residency when I started my degree. Um, and when I started, I was thinking more um, kind of more like quality improvement and um, really just wanting again, you know, formal training for, for that and some patient safety as well. But like going through the program, just opened up a lot more opportunities for where I thought my career could go. Um, and so kind of, especially with having that public health um, kind of gestalt to everything. And um, so start doing a lot more with kind of patient safety and health equity and um, community-based participatory quality improvement and health equity. So kind of a lot more with that. And it's been really valuable in my institution. Um, to kind of to have my career go go where it's going and then just to say about the biostatistics course it it seems overwhelming but I'll say that Dr. McGree is great like it is it is great he makes it um fun and his lectures are really engaging he makes it fun like even the homework's pretty fun like in another life if I had, had him as like my first biostatistician in you know in college or med school I might have been like a biostatistician but um, it was, it was too late by then, but it, it's really doable and he makes it fun for sure. So it's not, it's not as daunting as, <laughs> as we may make it seem. It's, it's really interesting and applicable to like articles you're already reading anywhere. You just have like research articles. You just have a better understanding of, of, of the, the data and research. Thank you. Thanks for answering. Yeah, you, we try to, we say sometimes that, I say sometimes that we're giving people a different set of lenses to look at things that they are have, have looked at before. Um, if you, uh, after taking a couple of biostat courses, where, as Melissa is saying, when you read an article, suddenly you are reading it differently and maybe interpreting it differently. Um, it, with a focus on quality or a focus on 
um, uh, measurement or a focus on what the policy implications of something might be. Um, you might be looking at exactly the same substrate, but come to um, some different insights. So uh, again, I think that it's, um, I don't think you should do this as a hobby, but uh, you have to decide if this, if this would benefit you, I think. Thank you. Yeah, it will benefit me. I, I understand that, but, um, but. I was, no, I was wondering how extensive is that? That's all. Yeah. How extensive is that? But thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you can get more details on sort of the finances for sure. Um, I think that this course, um, a, a little bit of a shorthand is that it is, uh, the, the masters of public health, uh, the MPH degree is, um, is expensive. It's, uh, I think the tuition is, is 60,000 or more, um, these days for the, for the degree program. And this is the course, this course is, uh, I don't want to say it's discount at a discount, but it is, it is more than half, but less than two thirds of what the tuition is for, um, you know, for our standard MPH degree. Um, we are remarkably at the end of our time and uh thank you for joining us um and for making it fe us feel like at least uh we were we our our evening has been well spent uh it's nice to meet you it's, it seems like you would all be terrific students if that uh if you felt the same way um we are uh, uh morgan mentioned that the application and the personal statement is important and I think I, I would not overemphasize how important that is, or I think you can't overemphasize. Uh, we want to accept people who we think can do the work, um, but who would benefit and whose careers would benefit from the material. This is really a, a little bit of a practical uh, course that aims to hand people tools to do more or better um, at what they are doing or want to do. So, um, uh, if you if if you and others think more about this and can figure out a, a story that makes sense, um, we would uh, very likely welcome you to, to, into the program. And uh, I think we could all have a good experience. Special thanks to uh, Morgan and Matt, of course, but really special thanks to Melissa. And uh, Maha and Nadja and Pallavi, it's nice to meet. Um, I hope we see you, all of you, uh, or some of you, um, in, um, in a future uh, September, uh, August, September, when the next year starts up.